Oh God, our Father in heaven, we thank you today that you are calling us to focus on you. You are calling us to turn the totality of our vision towards you. And God, we're here for no other reason today than to focus on you, to worship you, to lift up your name. The heart cry of every one of us is, God, we need you. You, you are God and we're not. To put in our soul and spirit the words that we've sung with our mouth, Jesus, 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 sweetest name we know. God, I pray that that would truly be the reality in the next few minutes as we continue to worship you now through uh, the word. I pray that your word, the Bible, would come alive in our life and that would, would, would draw us to you, would point us towards you. God, again, I just pray that the the many distractions of this world would be blocked out of our mind as we focus on you, as we replace whatever uh, troubles we may have, whatever sorrow we may have, whatever uh, direction the world may be pulling us to. I pray that in the next few minutes, God, we will just focus on you and worship you and praise you through this divine, holy, perfect, precious word that you've given us and that you want to deliver into our lives today through the power of your Holy Spirit. God, I want you to change me. God, I want you to change the, the mind and the heart and the life and the direction of every person here today to be more like you as a result of our worship of you today. In Jesus' name now, we continue to worship. Amen. I invite you to take your Bible as the children are being dismissed today. If you're in uh, elementary school and you're still in, just uh, feel free to take off right now and head to your place of worship. Uh, for those of us who continue in here, I invite you to, to open your Bible with me to the, to the book of Colossians. We started a, uh, a series last week through the, the book of Colossians and we'll be We'll be continuing with this process between now and Thanksgiving. Uh, so we want you to get comfortable with, with this little letter that Paul wrote to the, the church at Colossae. Today we're picking up with verse 9 and reading down through verse 14. Uh, so I'll read aloud and you follow along with me as we read God's Word together today. Colossians chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. And so... From the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of, the, of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins." This is the word of the Lord. Well, I have an eye appointment tomorrow for my annual eye exam. Uh, according to one of the most renowned pediatric ophthalmologists in our state, uh, I have a very difficult case with my eyesight. I have diplopia. Technically, it's hypertrophia of the left eye and fourth nerve palsy in the left eye. The result is I have double vision. So I've had surgery twice for this and they're reluctant to do surgery again and so they've chosen for the rest of my life to correct my vision with, uh, with uh, prisms in my glasses. Uh, I've said this to you before, if you ever see me driving down the road without my glasses on, 
you better hit the ditch because I don't know which image is which as I struggle with uh, focusing on the right image with my eye. While we live here on this earth, we, we live in two different kingdoms. And these two different kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of the world, are sort of like double vision. They, they pull apart from one another. Uh, one, the kingdom of heaven is focused on uh, the reality, is focused on what God has created us to see and experience in this world. On the other hand, the kingdom of this world, because of sin, pulls us away from the kingdom of heaven, away from the kingdom of God. And so the reality is that uh, we live in these two worlds and we have to decide where we're going to focus. Uh, symptoms of living in the world are things like selfishness and pride and lust and covetousness and greed and comfort and addictive behaviors like drinking too much alcohol and taking drugs and sexual immorality, and so forth. And later in this book of Colossians, uh, we're going to deal with some of these symptoms of what it looks like to live in, in the world and according to the kingdom of the world. Taglines for living in the kingdom of this world are things like, I have my rights. I have to look out for myself because nobody else is going to look out for me. Whatever feels good, I'm going to do it. And here's the biggest one. Nobody is going to tell me what to believe or what to do. The kingdom of heaven, on the other hand, focuses on knowing God and enjoying a standard of living that is dependent upon Him. A standard of living that honors Him above my worldly desires, my fleshly desires. Symptoms of living in the kingdom of heaven are things like putting others before yourself, giving, expecting nothing back in return, drawing close to God for guidance and comfort in times of pain and distress, rather than turning to uh, pain-altering substances, addictive substances and behaviors. Things like loving and praying for people who hurt you and forgiving them rather than trying to get even with them or resent them. So the highest goal of living in the kingdom of heaven is knowing God and letting His Spirit guide the way I think and the way I feel and the way I act in my life. So again, I think my eyesight is a very good example of living in these two kingdoms. The, the, the kingdom of this world has a dead nerve caused by sin. And because of that dead nerve that's caused by sin, my life tends to be out of alignment when I live according to the kingdom of this world. My life seems to drift away from God rather than be pulled toward God, like correct vision, spiritual vision, offers us in the kingdom of heaven. So you and I have daily choices to make, and these daily choices are either to be alive to the kingdom of this world, and dead to the kingdom of heaven, or on the other hand, alive to the kingdom of heaven, and dead to the kingdom of this world. We have to make that choice every day. We have to make that choice usually many times every day. So how can you be alive in the kingdom and correct the powerful drift created by the kingdom of this world that pulls you away from God? So here's our question for the day. If you have kids, when you go home, the kids are going to ask you this question. It's in your worship God. How can we live heavenly lives in this world? And that's what we turn to in our scripture today in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 14. And let me say this. This message today from God's Word is so practical. It's dealing with daily practical decisions that I have to make and that you have to make a choice between living according to the standard and the kingdom of this world or choosing to live according to the standard 
of the kingdom of heaven. So how can we live heavenly lives in this world? Let's look at it. First of all, we can live with wisdom in God's kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven. Verses 9 and 10 again. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that, or so as, to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now understand, this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, was written to Christians. It was written to believers. And when you become a believer, when you accept Jesus Christ by faith, and you become a believer, God gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't know that there's a greater gift on planet Earth than that. Because the Holy Spirit of God is given by God to believers to guide us as we navigate through the circumstances of this world. Among other things, the Holy Spirit instructs us in our walk with God, guides us in our walk with God. The Holy Spirit gives us wisdom and understanding in our personal relationship with God and how that affects our relationships with other people. The Holy Spirit draws us out of a life that is focused toward the comfort and convenience and selfishness of this world and draws us to walk according to godliness. Our lives can truly be a presentable life before God that is impacted by the goal and desire to be godly. He guides us. The Holy Spirit guides us away from the kingdom of this world. So being alive in God's kingdom begins by being led by God's Holy Spirit. That's a gift that every believer has. And as a believer, again, the Spirit draws you to the love of God. Greater love has no one no one than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. God loves you and has expressed that love for you infinitely through giving his life for you. Are you aware, as Paul wrote this letter, that two times already in the introduction of this letter, last week we looked at one, this week we look at another, two times he's focused on the fact that he has in his heart not just a love for God, but a love for the church at Colossae that's so big that he cares enough for them to pray for them. Prayer is a tremendous asset that believers have as we look at our life with God and grow our lives toward godliness. This, this letter again was written to the church and a man named Epaphras traveled all the way from Colossae 200 miles from Ephesus and probably about 200 miles on over to Rome. He traveled all that way just to share with the Apostle Paul prayer requests. And this letter is written in response to that prayer request that, that Epaphras brought to Paul. I hope and trust and pray that you are connected enough with God's people in the church that you have people who are praying for you. I, I have people who are praying for me every day. I have humongous needs in my life. I have needs in my life that I can't manage. And I need people praying for me. So every day I have specific people who are, who are praying for me. I know that. Do you? Do, do you have people who specifically are praying for you? When I have to make a huge decision. I mean, I literally have a list of people in this church that I share my life with and ask them to pray for me. God demonstrates His love for us through prayer. And a, a great advantage to being part of a local church is having people, people who love you enough to pray for you. So let me encourage you again 
to have people who are praying for you on a daily basis, have people who are praying for you when you face big events in your life. So again, look at what Paul says. He says, we have not ceased to pray for you. It's wise to ask people to pray for you. And it's wise to have people in your life that you can depend on that you are actually praying for. This, again, is so practical. It's, a, it's, it's, it's like breathing in spiritual life. You pray for people. You have people praying for you as a normal, regular, everyday, ordinary application to life. So what do we pray for? Well, look at the second part of verse 9. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom, there it is, and understanding. See, the knowledge of God is not a, a secret knowledge. Everything you need to know about God is found in the Bible. And spiritual wisdom and understanding comes from God speaking to you through the Bible. That's why it's so important every day to read God's Word, every day to read God's, the, the Holy Bible. Because that's the way God has chosen to reveal Himself to us. Through the Bible, through His Word. And spiritual wisdom, here's how it works. It flows from the Holy Spirit of God into your life through God's Word, through the Bible, as you are willing to open up your life and consistently read God's Word and ask His Holy Spirit to reveal His plan and His purpose and His will and answers to tough questions that you're asking in your life. So spiritual wisdom only flows through the Holy Spirit of God to humble, obedient followers of Christ. One of the saddest stories in the Bible, some of us in our small group recently have been working through 1 Samuel. And in 1 Samuel chapter 28, there's one of the saddest stories in the Bible. King Saul, who had been chosen by God to be God's leader for his people Israel, had lost contact with God. How sad. Saul prayed and asked God for an answer, and he didn't get an answer. He didn't get an answer because he was not being obedient to God. In fact, he was being disobedient to God. And he couldn't get an answer from God for his prayer, and so he turned to the way of the world. He turned to a medium to ask advice from a witch, a medium in the world. How sad. How sad. Wisdom for those in the kingdom of heaven will never make sense to those who are driven by the kingdom of this world. It's like mixing oil and water. So look at verse 10. The Bible says that spiritual wisdom and understanding prepares those who walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to be fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You want wisdom from God? Well, come to Him on His terms. Come to Him with a humble, obedient spirit. And let His knowledge become wisdom for you and guiding you as you walk with Him. See, it's wise. It's very wise to live with spiritual wisdom and understanding so that your life will produce spiritual fruit for God. Are you aware that that's why you're here on this earth? <laughs> you're, you're here on this earth to be drawn to God and walk with Him so that your life can point people as an example for what it looks like to know and follow God. And you can lead a life worthy of the Lord, as Paul says here. He, he lists some of these fruits, being worthy of the Lord. That means you make decisions with a conscious awareness that your life is going to reflect a close walk with God, a close relationship with God. He says you, you, you can live a life pleasing to the Lord or he wouldn't have listed this as a fruit of walking in wisdom with God. 
your life can bear fruit through your service. That's why you were put here on this earth. Your life is bearing some kind of fruit, either good fruit or bad fruit. And when you're living with wisdom, you want your life to bear fruit that looks, smells, tastes, acts godly. Godly lives. And then in verse 11, you, you can always desire to increase in the knowledge of God, although you will never be satisfied with what you know about God. God is infinite. He's infinite. And throughout eternity, I believe my picture of heaven is that we're going to go through eternity learning more and more and more and more about the aspects and dynamics of the greatness of God. Because He's infinite. We will never discover all there is to know about God while we live here on this earth or as far as that concerns in eternity. Because He's, he's infinite. And again, in, in verse 11, you can joyfully endure everything with patience. Now, this is where the application to the result of walking with God and wisdom gets really practical. Really, really practical. This doesn't make sense to the way of the world. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying here. I'm not saying that any of these fruits of walking with God and wisdom can get you to heaven. They can't. That's, that's not what getting to heaven is all about. There's only one way you can get to heaven. And that's by believing in Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So the only way you're going to get to heaven is by believing in Jesus and putting your trust and faith in Jesus. But when you know Jesus, and when your desire is to walk with godly wisdom on this earth, then the fruit of your life is going to look like what Paul is painting here. Believe in Jesus. Truly commit your life to living in the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of this world. And these fruits of the kingdom living will be evident in your life. They're a result of your relationship with God. They're a result of your growing faith in God. How does God measure true wisdom? Well, He measures true wisdom by practical obedience. God's Word sets some standards for us to live within. And we live within those standards out of obedience. Now understand this. And I'm a good example. You're not going to be perfect while you live on this earth. That's not the goal of the prayer that Paul was praying here. He knew he wasn't perfect. He struggled with issues in life that drew him away from God. We're not going to be perfect while we live here on this earth. But the goal of being alive in the kingdom of God is to keep on growing in godliness and be more and more and more and more like Jesus every day. To have more and more and more aspects of walking with God in our life every single day. So when making a decision, every believer should ask a simple question. How will the decision I make reflect on my growing relationship with God? Every decision reflects on our growing relationship with God. So how can I make a decision? Some of you today have never given your life to Jesus. You've never trusted Him. you never believed in Him. The first step to growing in godliness with God is to trust Him, to believe in Him, to give your life to Him, to say, okay, God, and this makes no sense with the way of the world. I'm willing to give up my way. I'm willing to let you change my life. I'm willing to let you reset the goals of my life and the standards of my life and replace them with your word, with your truth, with your fruit. So to live in the kingdom of God requires hearing God speak to you through the Bible. There's no other way. 
When someone joins this church, like many have done recently, we always have a membership conversation. Right, Linda? Scott? This past week, we had one of those membership conversations with uh, this couple in our church. And they moved here recently, and they have a house in a brand new area that wasn't even here a year ago. The, the neighborhood they bought a house in doesn't even, wasn't even in existence a year ago. And so when I left here to go make that visit with them and do the membership conversation, I plugged their address into my GPS. And about 20 minutes later, after following the prompts to their house, there I was, out in the middle of nowhere in Horry County, but I showed up in their driveway. Why? Because I followed the props in the GPS until I got there. God's Word is like a spiritual GPS for you. God's Word will guide you so that you can end up with your life and the decisions you make with your life where God wants you to be in God's time, in God's place. Now, these seemingly impossible results of wise living can only be achieved one way, and that leads us to number two, verse number 11. We can live with power in the kingdom. We can live with power in the kingdom. Verse 11 says, being strengthened with all power. Circle that phrase. According to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. So, we have the, the possible way to lie, wise living in an impossible world if we follow the props of the world. The result of wise living can't be accomplished in the power generated from the kingdom of this world. It can only be generated through the power of God, through His glorious might, according to the Apostle Paul. Are you aware of the glorious might of God? See, the power of God created this world. He spoke the world into existence with His Word. The power of God created the God who left heaven and came to earth and became flesh like you and me. Only the power of God could do that. The power of God inspired living a perfect life. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, lived a perfect life. So His blood, perfect, without spot, without blemish, could pay the price for the penalty of your sin. And then the power of God raised Jesus from the dead after He was crucified and tortured and bled to shed His blood to pay for the penalty of your sin. No other power can raise somebody from the dead other than the power of God. And here's the beautiful thing about the power of God. That same power that created this world, that same power that created the God-man, Jesus, to walk here in the flesh on this earth and live a perfect life, the same power of God that raised Jesus from the dead after He died for your sin, that same power is available to your life today. Do you understand that? Only the all-powerful God who has demonstrated His power in every way to us can allow us to access His power, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And Paul was celebrating that. We can live with power over the power of this world over the, the draw of this world away from God. We can live with that same power because it's available to us today and, again, in practical ways. Imagine this. Imagine a person that's so far in debt that they can never get out of debt. The power of God can 
allow that person to be restored in their finances. I mean, God has a plan for even restoring finances after we make terrible choices and follow the way of the world with our own comfort and desires. God has the power to resurrect us from financial debt. You may be buried in grief over the loss of a loved one. And some of you have experienced this. God's power, the power of God, can resurrect your life and restore you after working through that grief process to a full and meaningful life. That's the power of God at work. You may be buried in defeat and frustration with overcoming an addiction to alcohol or drugs or sex or whatever. The power of God is available to replace that addictive behavior with a passion for living a godly life, for making choices and choosing behaviors that demonstrate the resurrection power of Jesus. There's nothing that you battle with in life that the resurrection power of God can't give you victory over because God is that powerful. And He has released His power into your life when you become a believer in Jesus Christ. Your marriage could be dead. God's power is available to resurrect your marriage and breathe life back into a dead relationship, a dead marriage. What am I saying? Saying the kingdom of the world, according to Paul's prayer, the kingdom of the world is going to pull you away from godliness. It's going to pull you away and, and encourage you to make decisions that are best only for you. You draw a circle around yourself and every decision you make is about what's best for me. On the other hand, the power of God draws you away from your self-interest and points you toward what's best for the glory of God. And what's best for people who are far from God, who need to go know God and, and, and see the power of God released and working in my life. So the choice is follow the way of the world to self-destruction or follow the power of God to life, meaningful life, and life that can be transferred from generation to generation. God draws you to a kingdom way of living that draws you to real life with His power. So I encourage you today to join me and choose God's resurrection power. The last part of verse 11 is so encouraging. It encourages us to live with patience, with joy. That's a heavenly kingdom virtue. When you face difficult situations in life, when you deal with Difficult relationships, difficult people. The power of God can dictate how you look at God and how you treat other people. So let me ask you, are you willing to pray and ask God to give you a heavenly perspective? Are you willing to pray and ask God to give you power from Him to overcome even tough relational challenges or other kind of challenges that might be drawing you away from God and drawing you to the world. His power is available. Once heard the late R.C. Sproul say, when anger is present, look for pain. In other words, hurting people do what? They hurt people. And when a relationship is destroyed by the inappropriate expression of anger or anything else, whatever else, it takes compassion and patience to restore life to that relationship, and that's what God offers. That's the power that God offers. The power of God gives power to restore broken relationships and restore my life, even after I've made horrible choices, bad choices, the power of God can resurrect the purpose of God for my life. Are you aware that patience is not a virtue in this worldly kingdom? It's a heavenly kingdom virtue. 
And we can live with resurrection power in the kingdom because God has made it available to us through his word and through his spirit. Resurrection power is available to all who are alive in the kingdom. And that leads me to the third thing. We can live with gratitude in the kingdom. I, I, I love, I love this introduction to the letter of Colossians. Look at verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in His inheritance in the inheritance of the saints in light. So as Paul prayed for this church, as he prayed for believers in the Colossian church, he gave thanks to God. I'm so thankful for Palmetto Shores Church. Let me just give you a few reasons why I'm so thankful for this church. Number one, I'm thankful that this church is drawn to the truth of God's Word. You want this Bible, you want God's Word to be your standard for life. And I'm so thrilled, I'm so thankful that you are drawn to God through His Word and you have a passion for God's Word. I'm thankful today that, that you enjoy having as an ultimate goal for your life a, a relationship, a personal relationship with God. And that personal relationship with God controls the way you have relationships with other people in God's family and the church. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful that you are consistent in using the leadership gifts that God has given you to impact this church and impact the kingdom. I'm thankful to God for raising up leaders in this church who continue to grow in His grace and in His knowledge who want to be effective in working in this church and also effective in working in the, in the, in the kingdom, in the community. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful that you're a church that follows the example of Jesus in humility. Jesus, the Bible says about him, he, he humbled himself and became a servant as a man. Why did he do that? He did it to set the example for you and me to follow. Jesus said, I, I did not come into this world to be served, but to serve and to lay down my life, to give my life as a ransom for many. Now, how are you qualified? This verse says that God has qualified you, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Uh, what qualifies you to be in God's family, in the kingdom of God? I don't know about you, but I'm thankful that I'm not qualified by my looks. <laughs> um, the Bible says God looks, uh, man looks on the outside appearance, but God looks on the heart. I, I'm even thankful that God doesn't qualify me by my heart. Because my heart is wicked. And so is yours, if you didn't know that. I'm thankful that God has not qualified me by my ability I'm thankful that God has not qualified me by, by my knowledge. No, no, no. None of these things are qualifications for knowing God and serving God. There's only one thing that qualifies. You know, you know what it's like to be qualified for something. You, you want to buy a house. You go to the bank and they qualify you to how you're have a capacity to pay back what you, what you borrow. You go, you buy a car today, they, you're qualified uh, before the bank will loan you the money. You know what it's like to be qualified. There's only one thing that will qualify you to know God and to be in His service. You know what that is? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. You're, you are qualified to know God and to serve Him because your name has been signed in blood by Jesus Christ himself. 
How could you not be thankful for that? How could you not say, when you think about what God has done? I mean, I, I, I think about, you know, what God has done for a wretched sinner like me. To shed his blood and pay the price for the penalty of my sin. And when I understand just a little bit of that, a little bit of the scoop of that, I can't help but be thankful. God qualifies those who believe in Jesus, who put their faith in Jesus. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is just another way of saying that grace and faith are gifts from God that He gives to those who will put your trust and faith and belief in Him. See, no one is qualified until God qualifies you through the blood of Jesus. And you're only qualified by coming to God by grace through faith in Jesus alone. So have you done that? Have you come to God taking the grace and the faith that He offers you and let the blood of Jesus pay the price for the penalty of your sin? Because that's the only thing that can qualify you to know God and to serve Him. And every day you can live with gratitude because He has qualified you for life in His kingdom. And I'm so thankful that when you're qualified by God and receive the gifts of grace and faith, you're promised an inheritance. We see that again in verse 12, the last part. The inheritance that God gives you and me is so much greater than any inheritance that you could receive on this earth. Take the whole world, but give me Jesus, the songwriter says. The inheritance that we have in the kingdom of God is eternity with Him here on this earth as well as in heaven. And so the inheritance that God gives means that you are fully alive in His kingdom on this earth. And that's only a down payment. That's only a foretaste of the inheritance that we're going to receive for eternity when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Understanding that, I want to challenge you today to live with gratitude, live with a thankful heart. I pray that you are living with wisdom and that you're living with power and that you're living with gratitude today because number four, we can live with forgiveness in the kingdom. And this is a two-edged dynamic. Verses 13 and 14. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The kingdom of this world is referred to throughout the New Testament as the kingdom of darkness. Jesus is the light of the world. And when you trust Jesus, you move out of the kingdom of darkness and God transfers you into the kingdom of life. Not only are you thankful for that, but there's a dynamic to that that is practical, so practical. See, God qualifies you to share His inheritance as He transfers you from darkness to light according to this prayer, verse 14, by redeeming you and forgiving you in Jesus. What does redemption mean? Well, redemption means to save from captivity by paying a ransom. That's what Jesus has done for you. He has saved you from the captivity of sin by ransoming you with His own blood. Wow. He gives you His forgiveness. And so because of what Jesus has done to ransom you, you can live forgiven. There's there's nothing you've ever done that Jesus hasn't already paid the price to forgive. 
Doesn't that thrill your heart to know that you're forgiven? Forgiveness means that you no longer hold someone responsible for hurting you. What? There's no way the kingdom of the world can accept that. When someone hurts you, you want to get revenge. You want to get even. Not in the kingdom of heaven. How does that work? Well, I look at the benefit of when Jesus hung there on the cross. Think about this. Jesus hung there on the cross, and what was the last thing He said before He breathed His last? He was bleeding and dying after being tortured by me. My sin put Him there. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And to the degree that I have been forgiven, I then want to forgive other people. That's not from this world. That's only available through the kingdom of heaven. Forgiven people forgive people, just like hurting people hurt people. There's a story that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 18. In this context, uh, Peter asked Jesus, how many times should we forgive somebody? Seven times. And here's what Jesus said. He gave a story. He said, there was a man that owned millions of dollars to someone who had loaned him money. Millions of dollars. The person, the lender, said, I'm going to put you and your family in prison. And the guy fell down before the lender and said, please, 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 don't put me in, in prison. Don't put my family in prison. And the lender forgave him. The guy left the lender, went out on the street, saw a guy that owed him hundreds of dollars. He had been forgiven millions. This guy owned him, owed him hundreds. And he started choking the guy and shaking the guy and said, you're going to prison if you don't pay me back now. Do you see the picture? Do you see the point Jesus was making? How could we not be willing to forgive someone who has hurt us in light of the fact that we have been forgiven millions. We've been forgiven infinitely by the grace of God. Now again, these are symptoms of living in a heavenly kingdom rather than a worldly, earthly kingdom. And I'm so thankful we have between now and Thanksgiving to un unpack a lot more of this practical application kinds of, kinds of stuff. But for today... How can we live heavenly lives in this world? There's only one way. And that's by receiving the forgiveness that God has given us, accepting the ransom payment that He's made for us in Jesus, and then living to glorify God and enjoy Him supremely for the rest of our lives. You do not have to live in this world with double spiritual vision. You can choose to focus your life on walking with God and growing in godliness as Paul prays for the Colossian church here. Confess sin daily. Forgive freely. Because the price has been paid for you to be forgiven. And in the same way, godliness says we want to forgive others as well. So choose the kingdom of heaven over the kingdom of this world. That's my prayer for Palmetto Shores today. God, thank you. Thank you that you have a clear word for us that is wrapped up in the package of your grace and your love and your faith. Thank you, God, that living according to the standard of this world gets us nowhere. It's a dead end. But living according to your standard gives us life, abundant life. And I pray that not one person will leave here today without choosing life. 
thank you for offering it to us. In Jesus' name, amen.